to. Um, cool, so obviously like today is the last day. Um, we'll look at StyleGAN. Um, so StyleGAN is just, um, it's a, like basically the latest and greatest version of GANs. Um, all of these have been coming out for like the past three years and like, I feel like every six months someone puts out a new one where it's like, oh shit, this one blows all the other ones out of the water. StyleGAN was released or like announced in February and then like I think they put out the code like pretty recently after that. So like probably in like another month or two, like we'll have a new one that'll just be like even better than that. Um, so we'll sort of figure out, you know, what how to work with that one. Um, so again with GANs, like uh, we can talk about this for last, we talked about this last week, but like basically all it is is there's a generator and a discriminator. The generator makes new images, the discriminator tries to figure out if they're fake or not. Um, and as the journey gets better, um, it's gonna like the is gonna be like, oh, that's a real image. And then like we tell like actually wait, that's a fake image. So then like the discriminator gets smarter again, and then the generator gets smarter as we go through that. So like basically you're training each one of them to get smarter and smarter until like you get a reasonable representation of an image. Um, so what makes StyleGAN sort of the latest and greatest? Um, the first is that it's high resolution. Um, so when GANs first came out, they basically could do 64 by 64 pixel images, um, which is pretty clearly like pretty small. Um, style GAN can get up to 1024 by 1024, um, and I'll show a little bit about how, how that works and why they did that. Um, the other thing I talked about a little bit last week is like it works with better feature labels. Feature labels are basically just a way of saying like I know what this thing is doing. So again, that face I showed you that could like smile or not smile, um, which was pretty creepy. Like. That's a feature label. So the other one might be like, um, you know, glasses, no glasses, facial hair, no facial hair, black hair, brown hair, like other things. Um, and then like with those top two combined, you get a much better, like much more realistic image. So especially with like faces, um, it looks like pretty close to like real. Um, the other thing that's cool about this that I've actually never explored, but like is a possibility is you can actually take two faces and add them together. And like, so basically you could take a woman with like blonde hair and a guy with black hair and glasses and add them together and you might get like uh, a woman with glasses and black hair. Um, so like there's some interesting stuff you can do with these models that I've never really gotten that deep into because it's like generally takes a lot more math or like other thoughts and I've just never really touched it. Um, but there's some really cool stuff within there. Um, so I'll just quickly run through this. So this is an example of this is StyleGAN running at 128 pixels square, and this is every uh, test frame that this produces as it's training. So this is over, I don't know, what is this? 10 days? So you'll see it starts like really pixelated. So it basically learns like outside shapes and colors first. And then as it learns, it learns detail and it learns texture better and better. Um, and it also learns, you know, so it's sort of like, it learns basic shapes at the beginning and then it begins to learn more and more as it goes along. Is this, is this video that has been out, but is this something that you put together or this is Yeah, so this is, works? so basically the way it works is um, as it's training, it produces uh, test frames while it's learning. And then basically what I did, I took all the test frames over, I don't know, this actually might be, this might be only a couple days. So I took all of those um, and then just like put them into a video so you see a time lapse. Um, the next one, this is on 512 and this is, every one of these frames is every 12 hours. So if you see, like at the very beginning, whoops. So at the very beginning, you have this like very mosaic like thing, right? And you can kind of see like, oh, it's learning the greens are a little bit more popular. It's like learning that maybe like the lighter color should be around the outside. Um, in the next frame, whoops. This is gonna, I'm gonna get this eventually. <laughs> okay, so that's 12 hours between those two times. Like that's a huge leap, right? But like, so now we're at like pretty good forms, but like no texture. And like these are still like, 
you know, this is a 512 model, so this is probably like 256 by 256. So like, it's really not like picked up detail. So like, you can learn, the machines learn a lot really early on, and then it takes them like forever from there to like learn more. So that's in 24 hours. So like the problem with this is it takes a long time to get those details right. But you can learn really basic stuff. So if you wanted to like, I don't know, just take shapes, like you could do stuff with that really easily. But like to get to really like good texture, it takes a while. So that's 10 days, I think. But when you get these results, like is there one image from your data set that kind of looks similar to that one? There will usually be stuff that looks similar. Right. Um, it's and exactly the same, right? They're never exactly the same, um, or like you would hope they're never the same. Right. Um, and that's the thing that like people are not yet sure about with GANs is like just how much is it making up versus how much is it memorizing things. Right. Um, and I'm going to show a little bit of an example of like what goes wrong there um, when you like when it does memorize stuff. But um, so this is so when you hear talk about people talk about the latent space, that's that like 512 dimensional space that encapsulates all the features that it learned. Um, <clears throat> so this is like a flattened example of that. So basically, like, if you were to take all 512 dimensions and, like, squish them down to two, this is what you would get, which is, like, so this is also based on a number set. So, like, the dark blue is zero, the red is nine. And you can sort of see this is how it produces that space. So one of the things I always think is interesting is three is always close to eight because they look really similar, right? Like, all you have to do is, like, close those edges. So you'll see three, which is here, and eight, which is here. Like, they're basically overlapping. Um, and the machine might actually have trouble differentiating between those two. Um, although in this data set, we've gotten like really, really good. Um, and then what you're seeing output is like basically like a small latent set of those, actually might be like, sort of like this, and then put into a grid. So you'll see like the transition between sixes and twos are like pretty good. Although actually like why is a six over here, six is over here. So like actually it's probably a transition between a zero and a two. It's like trying to figure out how to morph between those two. So this is how we know that it's not like memorizing stuff because it would be like a hard jump between those. Right. Um, but what is it actually learning is like a little like this six might actually be in the data set. Um, so is it just learning how to transition between stuff or is it learning like the actual features is a little bit harder to say. Um, and that's why like the bigger your data set is the more likely you are to get features because it's going to actually like be able to like see differences between little things, right? Um, and then here again, so this is the creepy latent space, space smile. <laughs> so essentially what's happening there is if you go back to here, like you're sort of just drawing a line between these spaces and saying, you know, every one of these positions give me a new frame. Um, and he, they just happen to be able, like, they can sort of tell, like, this is the latent space for a smile, so it knows what, like, line to go against, the line to draw against. Um, so it'd be like drawing from, like, six to seven, and, like, saying, I want, like, this path or something, you know, so you might go through some other things while you're doing it. Um, so the question you have, which is, like, how, how do we know it's not memorizing stuff? Um, so actually, in a lot of cases, it will memorize things. Um, that's uh, a thing called overfitting. So you'll hear data scientists talk about like, oh, is it overfitting the data? Um, and what that looks like is if you imagine like that space again, um, where like that sort of latent space, like basically what it's, um, what it's trying to do is it's like imagining like, it's overfitting in a way that's like, I want this to go to here, to go to here. It's like memorizing those positions. Um, underfitting would be like, it's trying its best to just create one line, whereas like, this is like the best balance of those two, right? It's like not hitting every one of those points exactly, but it is sort of like matching the overall structure of the thing. Um, so here's an example of, on the left is a thing I trained. And you can see it's like sort of bouncing between images, right? Like it's not finding the shapes between those. And that's because this was trained on a data set that was maybe like 250 images. And like, so it's, uh, like images of cell phones and, and TVs, and like there just wasn't enough difference between those to like actually get like a realistic like data set. Um, so just like sometimes it animates a little bit, but it basically just bounces between them, and that's like a good idea. Like that's a good indication that it overfits because it's like 
clearly isn't finding like features that actually can can change between those two. Um, so like, this is actually a case where like maybe if I found a video of like a TV on like a like a Lazy Susan or a turntable, and I get like every like possible like angle of a TV, like I might take that video and strip it and like break it down to individual frames, and then I could actually like maybe like jumble up that set and it might actually learn like the differences in positions um but just the data i was getting it was like wasn't tight enough in terms of like the different spaces um so depending on what you want to do as an artist like it might not be terrible right like in some ways like i kind of think this first image is like kind of cool right those tvs are like kind of blobby looking and like weird um it might be a waste of the amount of time I took me to train the thing, but it worked. Um, whereas if I know I want to do an animation, like this is gonna be bad. Um, so it's kind of up to you if you like, like I know some artists are just like, it's cool, but it overfits. It gives me a look, it gives me like a style of thing. Um, so that might be enough for them. Um, for me personally, like this just wasn't, it ended up not being a worthwhile project. Yeah. So is overfitting generally just like, because your sample set isn't varied enough? Yeah, I think that's a good way of describing it. But it's also like, you don't want it too varied because if it's too varied, it's gonna try to cluster things by those variations. So if you have it too varied, it like, so for example, in the, in the TV set, I had like, so I had a bunch of just like straight up product photos. And then I found like some old photos of like TVs from the 70s, but they're like in an environment. So basically clustered all those and then it clustered all the product photos and it had nothing in between it. So it's actually like, depending on how big your set is, like you might just want like, uh, variations amongst things, but not have it be too clustered into like one or two areas. So yeah, um, one of the things that I always look at when I'm so basically the way this model works is it'll produce a steady set of images as it trains, um, and then you look at that set. One of the things that I always look for in these sets is like, uh, like how repeated are these images? So can anyone look at this thing and sort of show, point out where like images are repeating? Yeah, so like to me, the one that stands out here is this. Like it's here, 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 here. It's like kind of everywhere and they're slightly different enough, but like they're also like pretty close to each other. So like in a set this varied, like I would expect it to be like a little bit broader. Um, like I would expect more stuff like this and this. Um, but also like this one's a good example. This one's such a weird photo that you start to see it like everywhere, right? It's like pretty much memorized what that photo looks like. Um, so as I'm running these models, I'll generally check these every couple hours or like every morning and every afternoon and just sort of see like, am I getting a set that looks like it's pretty diverse? Because that's a good sign that it's not overfitting. Um, but yeah, again, this is also a case where like I had a small data set and they were pretty clustered pretty heavily. So just like couldn't learn how to, like it couldn't learn the features that are like actually the similar between all those. 